Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I'm very happy to see you, and I very much hope that you are having a very nice day, and that all is well with you during these times. And today, I would like to continue our conversations with regard to those films that can be found in this curated series of films with the title of Pioneers of African American cinema. Today I'd like to focus our attention on a, another silent film which is one of only a handful of surviving silent films as of right now from the great filmmaker. He's a really great artist of the early 20th century and that is Oscar Michaud. And the film in question today is his work, Body and Soul, which is described in the book included with this Blu-ray set from Kino as being from 1925. This is a work that I should point out is included as one of the films in this DVD set which I have here which is Spine 369 of the Criterion Collection. This set is uh, Paul Robeson Portraits of the Artist and one of the films that is included in this DVD set from the Criterion Collection is in fact the film Body and Soul and I've taken the liberty of pulling out the, the individual case as part of this set that includes the film Body and Soul. And I point, uh, I point to this also because this Criterion release, which is on DVD, has as part of its supplements an optional commentary track by Pearl Bowser. Now, for those of you who are aware of this set and are aware of the cinema of Oscar Michaud, you will undoubtedly recognize the name of Pearl Bowser. She is a scholar, she is a film studies expert, she is a historian, and she gives us her great insights into the life and career of Oscar Michaud and with respect to the film Body and Soul. So if you are interested, please uh, check out the Criterion release of Body and Soul. Again, as included as part of this DVD set, Paul Ropes and Portraits of the Artist. And by the way, it is included as part of the set, Paul Ropes and Portraits of the Artist, because as you know, Paul Ropes and stars in the film Body and Soul in two roles. And uh, it is all, they're very memorable roles. And this is also his film screen debut. So this is a very significant film uh, for many reasons within the uh, discussion of Paul Robeson's career. But also it is a very significant film with, uh, within the discussion framework of Oscar Michaud's filmography. So in any event, my friends, please check this out if you can. And also the Pearl Bowser commentary track uh, is splendid. And so please check that out as well if you have the opportunity. Once again, Pearl Bowser's commentary track as included with the Criterion Collection release on DVD of Body and Soul. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps also I think the, the Pearl Bowser commentary track could be made available on the Criterion channel, at least as of now. So uh, if it is, uh, and again, I can't check for sure because I don't have the Criterion channel directly, but if it is available to listen to as part of one's uh, viewing of Body and Soul, then once again, uh, please uh, take advantage of that opportunity and watch Body and Soul. And then if you have the time, please watch Pearl Bowser's commentary track to it. It is really uh, splendid. And so uh, not to be missed, not to be missed. Incidentally, I should point out that the DVD set 
uh, from Criterion of Paul Ropes and Portraits of the Artist includes also a booklet and the booklet is also very helpful it has a number of essays with regard to the film uh, Body and Soul there is an essay provided by Charles Burnett the filmmaker Charles Burnett the essay is called In the Beginning Oscar Michaud and Body and Soul and the Charles Burnett essay is also uh, absolutely wonderful because he talks about Oscar Michaud's life and career uh, and uh, he also speaks about uh, Body and Soul, the film, and so uh, this is also something to check out. Again, if you are interested in this DVD set from Criterion, uh, it might be worth uh, checking out. But uh, in case you are interested, you are getting, among other things, the booklet, which includes an essay about the film and about Oscar Michaud, which is penned by Charles Burnett. So uh, also uh, worth checking out if you have the opportunity. So let us now devote our attention to the film itself, Body and Soul. And once again, this is a film from Oscar Michaud, and it stars Paul Robeson as two characters, uh, the Reverend Jenkins and Sylvester, and also stars Mercedes Gilbert as Martha Jane, and also uh, Julia Teresa Russell as Isabel, and Lawrence Chenault as Yellow Curly and others but this is the film body and soul the silent film body and soul there is so much going on in this brilliant towering work that is often considered by many to be oscar michaud's uh, great masterpiece we've already talked about uh, his earlier masterpieces within our gates and the symbol of the unconquered and in many ways the film Body and Soul is doing a lot of things that are similar in terms of thematic connection that we saw in those earlier works. Take, for example, Within Our Gates. And if you recall in that film, Within Our Gates, there was a really uh, powerful scene involving the church and a clergyman in the church. And the point in that film, Within Our Gates, being made that it would seem like the uh, African-American clergymen were taking advantage of the African-American parishioners to, in essence, distract uh, their audiences from the real pressing issues that confronted African-Americans at that time. And so this is a very uh, satirical, almost biting satire that Oscar Michaud is making at the expense of institutionalized religion in that famous scene in the famous movie Within Our Gates. I think something very, very similar, in fact, almost, uh, almost exactly the same, is occurring in the film Body and Soul, except it is occurring on a much broader level on the one hand, and then it's also occurring on a much more individualized level on the other. So there is an interesting paradox. Let me try to explain. On the one hand, the depiction of the church, religion, institutionalized religion, and clergy, and the corruptive nature of these institutions and representations and symbols, the corruptive nature, the corruption, if you will, of this side of society is embodied perhaps metaphorically, perhaps not, in the character of Reverend Jenkins. And this is one of the roles played by Paul Robeson in this film. A magnificent performance, a towering performance, a frightening, chilling performance, because his Reverend Jenkins is, in many ways, in many aspects, a villain. He is, in many ways, a monster. Uh, Professor Musser, Professor Charles Musser, in his essay uh, called To Redeem the Dreams of White Playwrights, Reappropriation and Resistance in Oscar Michaud's Body and Soul, which can be found in the book uh, Oscar Michaud and His Circle, African American Filmmaking and Race Cinema of the Silent Period, which is listed in the description box below. Professor Musser, in his brilliant essay, describes the character of Reverend Jenkins as a sociopath. And in fact, we are witness as viewers of this film to many acts of destructive 
nature and many acts that harm other people, harm other characters in the film. All along the way, of course, Reverend Jenkins is playing the role of the minister and he has his, his group, his congregation that he caters to in his sermons. And w among those people are, of course, uh, the character of Martha Jane. And throughout most of the film, we understand that Martha Jane and other members of that group, uh, for example, uh, Sister Lucy and Sister Caroline, uh, they all fall under the spell, if you will, of uh, Reverend Jenkins, as portrayed by Paul Robeson. And therefore, uh, we see a, a trickery that is being employed by the Reverend Jenkins character to the extent that it not only uh, indicates to us the uh, the dual or uh, the dual faced nature of the Reverend Jenkins character, but it indicates to us also and it shows us to the, ex the extent to which his character really causes a great deal of psychological damage uh, within the very framework of the community that is being depicted here. And so in that way, um, and let me just take a, a f one further step in that direction, of course, we see this psychological damage, and in fact financial damage that he causes. For example, he is the one who steals the money from Martha Jane, and Martha Jane doesn't even know this. And this further adds more psychological damage because this, uh, this uh, act of larceny is such that uh, he forces the daughter of Martha Jane, Isabel, to essentially uh, take the blame. And so that, on, that uh, not only harms Martha Jane in terms of the loss of the money, but also shifts the blame onto the daughter, uh, such that uh, mother and daughter are separated, thus causing uh, one of the, the central rifts, the dramatic rifts of the film, where the daughter, of course, goes to Atlanta, and uh, she is alone, she's starving, she's sad, uh, she is despondent uh, in Atlanta, only to have the mother at last uh, find her and follow her and discover the real horrible truth about uh, the daughter and the relationship with uh, Reverend Jenkins. Because as we know, it doesn't end there in terms of psychological damage. There is so much more horror that is being committed or that has been committed by Reverend Jenkins. As far as we know, there could be more, I don't know, but what we are shown therefore in the flashback, which is a very crucial flashback in this film, is the story of what happened between Isabel and uh, Reverend Jenkins in the rainstorm which caused them to try to find shelter one evening, the two of them alone, which then led to the terrible, terrible rape of Isabel by uh, Reverend Jenkins in the film. It's w one of the most horrible scenes, um, and uh, it's, it's terrible, it's chilling, it's frightening, it's, it's just abhorrent, and it was something that was committed by Reverend Jenkins. And so we see, therefore, the full extent of the abhorrent, horrible nature of this character, who is the minister. And he is a man of God who is preaching his sermons to a very eager and very warm and welcoming group of people, the community. And Martha Jane, up to most or through most of the film, was with him and she was siding with him. And she was siding with him so much so that she uh, really put her faith and her hopes in this man of God, uh, in the hopes that maybe uh, 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 that might form some kind of, of, of a bright future uh, for her daughter. And that was the reason why she was saving up her money, of course, as we know from watching the film. Well, this is, of course, a far cry from the true nature 
of the Reverend Jenkins character. And therefore, uh, this film can be seen, and it's been seen, I think, by critics of the time as well as uh, film historians and film studies experts and uh, experts of Oscar Bichel works and silent film experts in general. This aspect of the film has been seen uh, to be, in many ways, a kind of attack on the church, or perhaps to put it more, uh, more specifically, an attack or a, a, a scathing, uh, biting uh, depiction of a, a black minister in this particular community, in this African-American community as depicted in this film. And to show him and his true nature, of his true vile, villainous nature, not only that, he seems to relish in the downfall of many of the characters. Note his reaction when he sees Isabel leaving town. He is smiling, almost snarling, in fact, and he becomes a real sociopathic character, especially when we understand later on the true nature of his horrific crimes. And so, uh, and we understand from the outset that he is a kind of swindler and he is a man of many names from the very beginning shot of the newspaper article, the Black Carl uh, reference in the newspaper article at the very start of the film. And so we understand, therefore, his, his dual nature. Uh, the dual nature, of course, even further augmented by the fact that not only do we have a dual-natured character in Reverend Jenkins, but we also have the dual nature of the fact that there are these brothers played by the same actor, Paul Ropes and Sylvester being the other brother. And uh, this is all, therefore, to suggest that as a kind of through line with, say, Within Our Gates, where we had a scathing commentary on on uh, institutionalized religion and also through the symbol of the unconquered where we had a character who was a villain in that film uh, Barr and uh, he is described as being a former clergyman well a former clergyman who is also one of the villains in that film and then we tr go into this film Body and Soul whose main villain and uh, is a, a man of the church in this African American community and so I think the implications of this depiction of this kind of character um, uh, cannot go unnoticed. Uh, but what makes this depiction, I would suggest, very interesting is that it is all centered on this individualized creation. That is this one character of, of Reverend Jenkins, who, by the way, is oftentimes described as uh, having the first name Isaiah, I-S-I-A-H. Um, I'm sorry, I-S-A-I-A-H. So he's often described in the literature as having the name Isaiah, so I-S-A-I-A-H. Um, uh, but please note that the film spells his name I-S-I-A-A-H. And so, uh, for instance, Charles Musser's writings will always uh, describe his character's first name as the, the spelling I-S-I-A-A-H. So if you do notice that in some of the literature, that's the, the main reason why. Um, but in any event, Reverend Jenkins is being depicted in this way, but he is also an individual. And so unlike, say, the, um, unlike, say, the earlier uh, the earlier film Within Our Gates where we had um, a, a, a clergyman uh, seemingly acting uh, in cahoots with, uh, with a sort of a larger institutionalized notion of using religion to distract uh, African Americans from really being concerned about more pressing, uh, uh, more important issues about politics, about the nature of class, the nature of wealth, and the need for education. Religion in that film was being used as a means to distract and to uh, to to divert attention to other things. Um, here, uh, religion in the film Body and Soul is being almost personified, if you will, by this one character, uh, Reverend Jenkins, and so it might not necessarily seem seem to be. A, a message or a depiction, if you will, of institutionalized religion in the same way that we saw it depicted in Within Our Gates. Um, but 
there is still the fact that he is uh, part of the church and he is representing the church. And so I think in that uh, depiction alone, we do get this sense of a, a satirical or scathing look at the nature of institutionalized religion and its effects on African American community. And we see this also in terms of the effects in the way that the women in particular, especially Martha Jane, uh, really react to the minister and uh, the reverend and he he is uh, he is a uh, he, he has almost a, uh, a kind of sexual charisma. Uh, and this is, I think, due in large part to the charisma that Paul Ropes and the actor gives the part. But uh, there is a, almost a sexual charisma uh, that really draws uh, many people uh, to him and to his persona, which perhaps is the way in which he is able to distract uh, from the real nature of his horrible side of his character. And so perhaps in that way, there can be said to be a further mirroring or paralleling between Within Our Gates and Body and Soul. The idea of uh, the use of religion or the, the persona, personification of religion to distract the audiences from the real pressing issues. And here, Martha Jane is being distracted from the real issue that is the, the, the psychological and physical well-being of her own daughter. And so uh, so in that way, I think there, there could be differences, but there also could be similarities between this film and Within Our Gates in the realm of this discussion of religion. Um, but also we should point out uh, a fundamental difference. And Within Our Gates, I would, uh, I would uh, just note that it wasn't a big part of that film. In other words, the, the this church scenes in that film were actually, a, in terms of a running time, a relatively small part of that film. It wasn't the main focus. It was one of the foci of that film, but it wasn't the main focus. So there wasn't a lot of time devoted to this part of that film. Here, uh, religion is front and center. But what is interesting about the storyline in uh, Body and Soul is note the reaction of the, the members of this congregation. And note that at the end, when Martha Jane returns from Atlanta, she reveals the truth. Uh, by this time, Isabel has died, uh, and uh, she comes back, and she reveals the truth in front of the entire church with uh, Reverend Jenkins there, and she says uh, all the she reveals the the true evil nature of the Reverend's character. And what happens? The whole group turn. Everyone in the group turns on the Reverend uh, in a show of solidarity with Martha Jane and the plight of Isabel and what has happened. And so, this I think becomes in many ways an answer or perhaps a development, if you will, of the way in which the the similar group of people in the film Within Our Gates essentially fell for the distraction of the imposed institutionalized religion that was shown in that film. Here, the group of people, they don't fall for it at the end. They fight back. And they call for a sense of justice because uh, Martha Jane's come back and she has revealed the truth. And they all turn on this man of God, this reverend. And so I see that as a, an interesting way that Oscar Michaud seems to be handling this critique, if you will, of institutionalized religion as found in body and soul. It is a continuation, yes, of what we saw within our gates, but it is also a furtherance of it in that we see the community rise up and uh, see the actual truth, and it, which leads to the, uh, the, the final conclusion of the film, which then leads to yet another conclusion of the film that it was all essentially a dream that Martha Jane was having. But the point is still there, which is that the community stands up. And this, therefore, seems to me to be one of the kind of solutions, if you will, that, uh, that Oscar Michaud seems to be presenting uh, in this film, Body and Soul. If you recall in the earlier film, Within Our Gates, I was suggesting that one of the solutions that Oscar Michaud was uh, suggesting in that film was the need for education. And yet there was a still a very uh, nuanced difficulty 
given the environment and the circumstances that faced African Americans uh, in terms of lack of, of funding for schools and the like, uh, that even this, this need for education uh, might not uh, be successful because of, the, uh, because of these external circumstances. But there was still that need as a means of achieving human dignity and thus a sense of freedom. Uh, here, it seems to be uh, uh, suggested that we, we're not talking necessarily about education directly, but we are talking about a community that needs to recognize the real villains, if you will, the real truth. And it's set in this story, in this narrative about a mother and her daughter and uh, a reverend and the, the brother and their twins and, uh, and, and the, the money that's stolen and it's all a dream. It's set all in the story. Yes, I grant you that. But it, al it also is showing us the need for a real uh, sense of community action that is based on knowing what the truth is. And so I, I see this as being one of the solutions, or maybe a solution is too strong a word, as one of the ways or keys by which uh, uh, Oscar Michaud seems to be suggesting that this uh, institutionalized religion and the way it is being imposed, this can be defeated uh, by means of knowing the truth, discovering the truth, and acting upon the truth. And yes, it is uh, agreed, it is set forth in the, this story, in this narrative. But still, I think the, the message is, is quite, uh, quite vivid. And so uh, uh, I find this, therefore, to be, in many ways, a, a kind of optimistic turn uh, from the perhaps more pessimistic, uh, scathing look uh, that we saw in the earlier film, Within Our Gates. It still leads, of course, in this film to a very tragic results uh, uh, with regard to the, 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 the real brutal beating and killing that we see um, uh, uh, the Reverend uh, actually engage in. It's a terrible act. And uh, we see uh, this, uh, this play out in the film at the very end. And so it's not as though it can lead to uh, a utopian, uh, peaceful solution, right? But uh, the point is that uh, there is this need of the community to recognize what the true villains are, in, at least in the context of this story. And so I find this to be, in that sense, a, a, a way of, of furthering the, the discussion of institutionalized religion that we have seen thus far and lead up to this film, Body and Soul. And so I, I find this to be very important. Um, and so th to, just to take a step back, we have in this film uh, a... Uh, but also, I should uh, uh, take a step back. We, we should also recognize that the character of of uh, uh, Reverend Reverend Jake Jenkins is not necessarily s uh, explored in an internal psychological way. In other words, we as viewers don't necessarily see why he's making the choices that he's making. He is presented more or less as a as a villain. And we don't necessarily see him struggle or we don't necessarily see his upbringing or why he became the type of person he did. We don't see his relationship with his brother, uh, Sylvester. Uh, there is uh, some vague references that are made to the brother relationship, but they're very, uh, they're very brief. And we never see this uh, play out in a kind of psychological uh, description or exploration of either brother. And so we don't really know why one brother ended up this way and the other brother ended up uh, in the other way. And so there isn't any kind of psychological exploration of this particular character who, as I say, seems to be representing uh, this side of institutionalized religion as being depicted in this film. However, we do get a psychological exploration of other characters that are being affected by uh, Reverend Jenkins and also uh, being affected by Sylvester, etc. And those are psychological examinations of the characters of Martha Jane and Isabel. And so, I, I, so we see, in a way, uh, the effects of the, the, the terrible acts, if you will, of, of this uh, Reverend 
And we see the psychological implications of that when we uh, examine or when we are witness to the effects, for instance, on Isabel and all the hardship that she feels, the torment, the struggle uh, about uh, wanting to tell her mother the truth but being unable to, being psychologically and physically coerced into revealing where the money is being hidden and further being psychologically and physically abused uh, to the point where she has no choice but to leave town and go to Atlanta on her own and eventually die there. Uh, so it's a very terrible and sorrowful and tragic story that is made even further uh, complicated and further uh, uh, the tragedy even made further realized by the revelation of the truth uh, that Isabel gives to her mother and thus to us in the flashback toward the end of the film that reveals the, the rape that occurred and uh, what happened to her. And thus uh, it really uh, presents a further uh, uh, tragic and horrific a uh, set of circumstances that have affected Isabel in a way that leads her to do what it is she does and ends and leads her to her ultimate end. A very sad end, at least within the dream, uh, which is the bulk of the film, of course. When uh, Martha Jane wakes up, we understand that the circumstances are much different and much happier. Uh, but at least within this film framework itself, we understand that Isabel's, uh, it, Isabel has been terribly affected by uh, the Reverend and what he has done. Uh, uh, and also Martha Jane, too. We see her, the mother, we see her being affected in a, uh, a, a quite an extraordinary arc, a character arc, because we see her at the start uh, f almost fawning over the Reverend, uh, really being the Reverend's ally and almost being seduced, if you will, by the charisma and appeal of the Reverend. So much so that she seems to want to side with the Reverend more than siding with Isabel in these very broad terms, of course. Only as we progress and as Isabel leaves and she runs away and then um, uh, Martha Jane uh, follows her and finds her months later and discovers the truth. Do we see Martha Jane change her opinion and perspective on the Reverend and she realizes the true evil nature which leads to the final confrontation and it leads to further tragedy of course but then we understand that she wakes up and it was all a dream and so uh, but we see this psychological uh, examination of these characters and it's further made interesting and fascinating by the inclusion of the the brother Sylvester right because Sylvester is is in many ways uh, the opposite of of the Reverend uh, he is he seems at least to be uh, a, a much nicer man he seems to be uh, more earnest, more hardworking, although he hasn't necessarily found success as an inventor yet. Uh, he seems to be really in love with Isabel and wanting to take care of her, especially after she reveals to him the truth about what happened between Isabel and the Reverend. And so uh, we understand, therefore, that Sylvester is a decent character, a decent man. Uh, Martha Jane doesn't see this. Uh, Martha Jane thinks that he is, uh, he is a kind of failure, if you will. And in fact, Martha Jane uh, uses the N-word, albeit spelled, uh, with, um, uh, spelled uh, with, a different, with the H at the end of the word, but still, uh, it, it, the use of the N-word, I think, is very, uh, it's, very, it's, it's a very uh, significant moment. Uh, because uh, uh, we also understand that Isabel corrects her and says, you know, don't use that word. It's vulgar. And this is such a key moment in the film because it indicates so many things. It indicates the real power, the destructive power of language and how it's e being used here by Martha Jane against Sylvester uh, only to be uh, found out by the end of the character arc that Martha Jane is in fact so supportive of Sylvester and then uh, realizing that the marriage between the two of them uh, uh, is, is one that, is, uh, that, that should be celebrated. And so that is a really uh, uh, quite a vivid uh, character arc that she takes. Right? But also the use of that word 
is very significant because remember how Isabel reacts to it. She reacts to it in a way that says, uh, you know, you shouldn't use that word. It's vulgar. And so we understand from that that, uh, that uh, Isabel is, uh, she, pr she probably has received in some form or another a formal education. And maybe the implication also is that Martha Jane has not necessarily received any kind of similar formal education, which is further suggested by the use of, of dialect in the intertitle cards uh, for Martha Jane's dialogue versus the, uh, the, the type of English uh, language that is being used by, for example, Isabel. And so there is a difference in the way that the English language is being used between Martha Jane and Isabel. Uh, but I don't think that is necessarily meant to show Martha Jane in a derogatory way. Um, she uses language in this way, yes, but she is corrected by Isabel. And that is further uh, augmented by the overall character arc that Martha Jane uh, herself takes. So I don't think we're meant to see Martha Jane herself as a villain. But remember also at the start of the film, we do see her as being, uh, being uh, swayed or being convinced by the reverend. And so we see her, but then we find out that she turns and she realizes the truth of that matter. And so I'd, I'd like to think that this similar type of situation that Martha Jane finds herself at the start of the film also changes and transforms into something more positive by the film's end. And I think that's, that's part of the reason why we see her using the language that she uses at the very start of the film versus her reaction and attitudes towards Sylvester at the end of the film, which are much more positive, much more glowing and much more supportive. Uh, and also, uh, uh, we have to understand also that with regard to the, the education and perhaps the fact that Martha Jane might appear to have uh, not received any formal education. This is not to suggest that Os Oscar Michaud is trying to depict her as being dumb or uh, uh, in any way stupid. Uh, on the contrary, I think Oscar Micheaux is depicting Martha Jane uh, as being a character that is very warm, that is a mother, that is uh, someone who works very hard. We understand that she performed many jobs in order to save up all the money that she saved up. And that's really a, a positive trait of her character. And also, she is very loving towards her daughter. Of course, uh, there is the, the fact that she is... Uh, she has been misguided and tricked by the reverend. That, that's, that's true. But then she realizes her, her error by the film's end. But uh, regardless of that for a moment, she is still so much in love and devoted to her daughter. And she's saying that she wants to save the money and, 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 uh, for her daughter. So she loves her daughter very much. And so she is expressing these tender moments, these loving moments of devotion of motherhood and uh, and uh, real caring for Isabel with the language that she's using as depicted in the inner title cards that, as I say, still show the, the way in which, uh, yes, the, a certain type of dialect is used. But that use of language uh, does not, in my eyes, suggest anything uh, in terms of the intelligence level of Martha Jane, in terms of the emotional uh, level of Martha Jane, because of the fact that what she is saying in those moments of dialogue as captured in those intertidal cards are really tender and powerful and very important things about the importance of motherhood and family. And so I find this to be, to be so uh, important about how these use of the intertidal cards and this use of language does not always, it doesn't mean that the characters themselves are in any way backward or stupid or anything like that. But in fact, they are showing uh, so much uh, uh, meaning and intelligence and emotion. Uh, it's just that they weren't given a formal education, uh, but they are still expressing uh, things that are so important. Uh, this reminds me a lot of the very brief scene in Within Our Gates, for example, where a father is shown with her with his children to be visiting the Piney Woods School, and uh, he's explaining 
to um, uh, to uh, the school, and he's explaining there. Uh, to Reverend Jacobs about how uh, he wants an education for his children. So remember that scene. It was very brief, but in that scene, the father is also described, and he's talking, and the intertitle cards are giving his language, the uh, a dialect. And so uh, that might suggest, just by looking at the words, that might suggest, that, oh, uh, maybe this character is of a certain class or of a certain intelligence level. But in fact, in fact, he is expressing in that particular moment the the key ideal of the importance of education and he's and he's expressing the importance of being a father who cares about his children so much that he's willing to to try to put them in the school and so he is in fact expressing the most one of the most humane aspects or humane moments of that film uh, and uh, and so, and his and his dialogue in those intertitle cards is is of a similar type of use of language that we see Martha Jane. And so, I find the parallels between these uh, characters and these depictions as seen uh, in Oscar Micheaux's films uh, within our gates and here, body and soul, to be very strong and to be very vivid and poignant. So, uh, uh, but and Martha Jane is a flawed character. That's for sure. Uh, but she is, as I say, one who achieves an extraordinary character arc. That's by the film's end. She really is in a place of real positivity. So uh, it's uh, the psychological examinations of these characters is, is astounding. And the implications of that also, I think, are very astounding. I mean, one of the questions of the film that uh, is left in the viewers, for instance, is I wonder what the psychological impact must have been on Isabel to have been in love with Sylvester or to be together with someone like Sylvester, who is, although miles apart in terms of character from his brother, the Reverend, still the likeness is so similar. They're being played by the same actor, of course, but the likeness is so similar. And so one has to imagine what kind of of psychological implication, if any, occurred inside Isabel's heart when she was with Sylvester, when she's with someone that she obviously cares for, but still has the look and appearance of the Reverend, the man who had uh, it, it, earlier had raped her, had sexually assaulted her. And so I can... It, it's very difficult for me to try to imagine the the implications of the psychological impact uh, uh, that might have occurred uh, with Isabel. Again, the film doesn't explore this aspect at all. And in fact, the film doesn't explore in great detail the relationship between the two brothers. And so we really don't know what the psychological and uh, the actual impacts were on the town and on the people by the very virtue of the fact that these are brothers in the same physical uh, uh, geographical vicinity. Uh, but I think one of the aspects that I, I think is, is uh, uh, one that I think further uh, enhances a discussion of the true uh, and uh, deep-rooted impact, psychologically speaking, of the Reverend's acts uh, vis-a-vis Isabel, I think is the fact that Sylvester looks so similar, uh, ex- identical to uh, her attacker. And so uh, I, I find that to be a, uh, a, a t- it's something that adds uh, further uh, room for discussion uh, when we're talking about the very complex uh, hero character tragic hero character that is Isabel, uh, a, a really powerful character, yet another powerful character in the, uh, the cinema uh, filmography of Oscar Michel. Uh, but, uh, so that is uh, just a, a general sense of the, the approach of Oscar Michel and the church and psychological examinations and uh, the Reverend and the brother and Martha Jane and Isabel. Uh, But that's not all of this film, of course, because uh, as Charles Musser was very, I think, very reasonably and very convincingly trying to assert and argue in his essay, uh, once again, the title is To Redeem the Dreams of White Playwrights, Reappropriation and Resistance in Oscar Micheaux's Body and Soul. I think what he was trying to suggest also is that Oscar Micheaux is really doing a lot of remarkable things here in that uh, he is also acting in a very subtle and almost meta way. He's acting in a way that's really trying to 
have uh, artistic dialogues with specific works of the theater written by uh, Eugene O'Neill and um, uh, Nan Bagby Stevens. Uh, the Eugene O'Neill plays being uh, the Emperor Jones and All God's Chillin' uh, Got Wings and Nan Bagby Stevens' play Roseanne. And so these, this cycle of plays, or this, this, this uh, very loose trilogy of plays, uh, all of which were, uh, had performances that featured uh, 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 Paul Robeson, uh, this uh, is something that was already known at the time, and the similarities between, especially the play Roseanne, and um, and also to a certain extent the play Emperor Jones, uh, the similarities between those films and this uh, those plays and this film, Body and Soul, I think are very evident, and, and again described so well by Charles Musser. Again, if you want, uh, you really should check out that essay by Professor Musser. It is a must read, and it adds uh, great descriptions of the plays themselves, and uh, therefore his arguments as to uh, his, uh, to borrow his phrase, uh, reappropriation of the theme and characters and concerns that were expressed in these plays about African-American characters written by white playwrights that were very popular at the time. Oscar Micheaux is essentially taking these, reappropriating them, to, again to borrow Professor Musser's phrase, and turning them into his own expression in cinema. And he's adding further dimension to this reappropriation by casting none other than Paul Robeson in his cinema debut, of course, but Paul Robeson, the actor who was uh, linked uh, in many ways to the performances of these three plays. And so uh, he is taking the themes and structures and characters and storylines and even the actor, and he's putting them in his film here. And what he is doing, as Charles Musser is, uh, I think, very convincingly ar arguing, is that Oscar Micheaux is, on the one hand, uh, trying to create parallels with these uh, discussions in the context of his race film. Uh, and uh, at the same time, he is reappropriating these, these stories and trying, therefore, to, to critique uh, what might be described as being uh, uh, certain uh, uh, certain uh, stereotypes that are being employed in plays, uh, these famous plays written by white playwrights. Again, uh, uh, suggesting uh, kind of the uh, the depiction of of in a kind of uh, African American characters and their experiences uh, in these plays. And he seems to be, on the one hand, paralleling these works, but also uh, creating critiques of these works. And all along the way, uh, creating an act of uh, reappropriation in the form of the power of his cinema. I'm talking about Oscar Micheaux, of course. And so this is a very complex meta kind of conversation that Oscar Micheaux, through his film, is having with these works. Now, Charles Musser, in his essay, I think very astutely, tries to make the point at the same time that this is not to say that the plays themselves are all 100% negative. There are some positive aspects that Charles Musser does identify with respect to these plays. Uh, for instance, they did provide uh, the opportunity for African American casts and African American uh, actors, uh, of course, most prominently uh, the actors uh, Charles Yopin and Oscar Michel, um, and excuse me, Charles Yopin and uh, Paul Robeson, and so um, uh, we did see uh, we did see uh, these actors gain a lot of fame uh, through their performances, and so uh, this provided. Uh, great opportunities uh, for uh, uh, careers. Uh, and so uh, this was, I think, uh, something that Charles Musser uh, points out very astutely. But at the same time, uh, they were dealing in what might be s described as being a very stereotypical or, or sometimes even negative uh, ways uh, when they were dealing with the African-American characters. For example, uh, Eugene O'Neill and the play Emperor Jones. Uh, the play uh, employs a lot the use of the N-word 
and in fact the the actor um, the actor uh, Charles Gilpin uh, who uh, played uh, Brutus Jones uh, the main character in the film The Emperor Jones uh, he it is uh, very well documented that he was uh, not comfortable at all with this use of the n-word and so he would uh, want to change uh, essentially change the lines uh, which really didn't sit well with the the playwright and then when uh, when um, uh, Paul Robeson came in uh, to uh, perform the role uh, at first, uh, he would be performing the role. Again, this is all described by Professor Musser and other scholars, but uh, Paul Robeson would be playing the role with the N-word intact. And so uh, this is, uh, this is a, a very, how should I put it, um, this is a way that, uh, as Charles Musser is asserting, this is a way that Oscar Micheaux is in one way taking, it, taking the story and putting it back and, and reclaiming it because when we're talking about the use of language if you remember we saw the use of of the n-word again spelled in a slightly different manner ending with an h at the end we saw the use of that word in um, um, uh, um, uh, when uh, uh, we saw the character of uh, Martha Jane talking about Sylvester and so uh, and then of course we remember that Isabel I think very significantly says you know you shouldn't use that word it's vulgar and this is a very important point and because this seems to be a point about use of language and uh, and if we note also uh, Martha Jane's character arc uh, to a, a place of positivity by the end. We, I think we can further understand the, 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 the real negative connotations of this word. Of course, we know the negative connotations of the word. It's a terrible word, of course, of course. Uh, but uh, if we remember also its use in uh, some of these plays, I think we can begin to understand, again, as Professor Musser asserts, that this is a film that seems to be reappropriating the content and one of the ways it seems to be doing this uh, by Oscar Micheaux's cinema is by showing us uh, in a very vivid way, in a very uh, pointed way, uh, how language is, uh, it can be destructive, but then how it can be, uh, how it can be defeated. And in fact, we see in this film, and I think which is a very significant and perhaps a very positive moment, uh, soon after its use, the character of Isabel, who is a very innocent character, a very positive character in this film. We see her uh, very gently rebuke uh, her own mother, uh, which I think, again, is a very significant point. And I think this is one that is a very, uh, almost a, on a meta level, uh, Oscar Micheaux really dealing with and critiquing uh, aspects of these plays and one of the aspects that he's critiquing obviously is the use of language and that adds even further irony to the casting of Paul Robeson in this film uh, because as has been documented uh, you know Paul Robeson and again has been described by Charles Musser Paul Robeson at least at first uh, he seemed to be going along with the the uh, the line of thinking that these plays that he was performing in were of a really high uh, artistic standard, including the use of language, etc. So we, we, there was no documentation necessarily of him uh, uh, really critiquing these, uh, the use of this kind of language in the plays that he was performing. A similar kind of thing happens with his performance uh, in the film Showboat um, and Old Man River. And uh, later in his career, uh, we will understand that uh, that Paul Robeson uh, will have uh, maybe slightly more uh, uh, slightly more complex views of some of the works and some of the songs that he performed, and it's such that by the end of his life, for instance, uh, with respect to Old Man River, we know that he changes uh, some of the lines to uh, really try to make more uh, points and more. Uh, moments of commentary and to change the language in a way that he sees as being more respectful and making uh, making a, a kind of statement, if you will. Uh, and so we see him employing uh, some of the things that, in fact, Charles Gilpin 
uh, was trying to do in the early days of his performances of, of Emperor Jones. And so, um, uh, but at this early stage, it would seem that, at least according to Charles Musser in the, in the uh, early to mid 1920s, it would seem that uh, Paul Robeson at the time wasn't necessarily uh, seeing that point. And so when he was cast, in Oscar Micheaux's film Body and Soul. Many scholars now, like Charles Musser, point to the fact that his casting in many ways is almost an ironic point because uh, it seems like uh, Tr uh, Paul Robeson, who at the time wasn't necessarily aware of the, the, the subtle implications of the, the w use of language or other subtle ways that uh, maybe uh, not so positive stereotypes were being employed in some of the plays that Paul Robeson was himself uh, uh, commanding and performing in. The fact that therefore Paul Robeson is being cast in this film by Oscar Micheaux, which in many ways is seen as being a, a um, uh, a reclaiming, if you will, or reworking or critiquing of those very plays that Paul Robeson really made his name in as a theater star, I think is, is a real uh, uh, artistic act. It's an artistic act of irony uh, that is also further uh, basis for the uh, interpretation of this film as a reworking of these plays and also a critique of these plays using Paul Robeson as a very visible and uh, a very direct means of that. And so, so much so that, according to Charles Musser, uh, for many years, Paul Robeson, uh, after the fact, he, according to Charles Musser, it would seem that Paul Robeson uh, finally understood the implications of Oscar Micheaux's casting him in this film. And uh, according to Charles Musser anyway, you know, Paul, Paul Robeson, for many years, uh, didn't necessarily want to acknowledge uh, this film, Body and Soul, in his filmography. But... Um, and that's a very interesting uh, uh, thing that Charles Musser uh, brings up. Once again, that's, again, further reason why you should check out uh, Charles Musser's essay. It's a really brilliant uh, essay, well-written. It's, it's fantastic. But, um, but it, this, again, to take a step back, this just, again, is another example of how absolutely complicated and complex this film, Body and Soul, is. And it's really operating on so many levels. Uh, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a really therefore a brilliant example of Oscar Micheaux's uh, cinema talent. Uh, but speaking of Oscar Micheaux's cinema talent, I think one of the other main components about this film that is so extraordinary is the fact that the film itself is really extraordinary. It is an extraordinary work. Absolutely is. It is almost like a a dream. Uh, it has dream logic that it is being employed. It's almost also like a film noir, and it is a film noir that uses flashbacks, that uses dream sequences, that uses um, disjointed chronologies to tell its story. And that is absolutely amazing. Once again, I go back to Charles Musser uh, in the interview that he gives as part of the supplements for this Kino set. He describes Oscar Micheaux as being a radical formalist. And he is an artist that is engaged in radical formalism. And this is the reason why Charles Musser considers Oscar Micheaux to be one of the great artists, one of the great artists of early American cinema, silent film, of uh, cinema, uh, simply because he is employing so many tricks and almost experimental types of cinema uh, in, uh, in his works. Uh, and to tell stories that I think are so rich and so deep and so complex uh, that they are uh, just uh, uh, absolutely extraordinary examples of cinema at its finest. So, for example, the newspaper uh, clipping at the very start, the Black Carl newspaper clipping at the very start, according to Charles Musser, this would seem to be something that would probably show up at the very end of the story because it indicates uh, the arrest of, of this criminal I'd be taken the, to the north for extradition to England, which uh, Charles Musser points out as being perhaps another meta joke or meta reference uh, to um, uh, Paul Robeson and the reappropriation of the so story and subject matter of the of the plays 
uh, because of the, the fact that the performances uh, were in England. And so uh, Charles Muster seems to be suggesting the possibility anyway. This is almost like an inside joke. Again, f adding more complexity to an already complex and fascinating work. But uh, th the point that I was wanting to raise earlier was that this newspaper clipping alone, the fact that it appears here at the very start, uh, but it, it's suggesting subject matter that really should be at the end of the film because it it's indicates the end of the story, etc. This already gives us a fragmented look at chronology and how time is used. Uh, we see fades. Uh, we see characters in the same situation fading out. For instance, there's an early scene between Isabel and uh, Martha Jane, and there's a little bit of an argument between the two of them about Sylvester, and then. Uh, it fades to black, and then it says a few minutes later, and then it fades, and it's the same scene. And they seem to be, uh, uh, have uh, made up, or there's, uh, it looks like they have made up, and Martha Jane is going into her reasoning, and she says oh, the reason why she's saving up the money uh, to for her daughter. And so uh, this is an interesting trick of using the, the fade to black and then returning to the same scene to suggest the passage of a few minutes, uh, which is, a, is, again, a really interesting use of time and space in cinema. Uh, but we see this employed so chillingly later in the film. Again, the idea of, of, of uh, you know, a shot and then go to uh, a, a, a black intertidal card suggesting the passage of time and then going back to the same scene. We see this again in the flashback uh, scene to the rape of Isabel by the reverend, right? Because we see the shot of the, the, f the shoes on the floor as they walk into the room. And then we see a frightened, uh, vulnerable, and frightened Isabel. And then we go to a uh, black intertidal card and it says, if, you know, a half hour later. And then we see the, the shoes going back to the door, of course. This is one of the most uh, famous and, and frightening moments of the film, of course, because of its content, its subject matter. Uh, but also, we see that Oscar Michaud is, again, in a similar way as before, employing a, a kind of cinematic time uh, and, and really warping time and space. Before, it was almost a warping of time and space to show us not just Martha Jane's love of her daughter, but almost her delusion in the fact that she really believes in the Reverend at the time. A real warping of time and space to show the deluded, but innocent, albeit deluded, uh, state of mind that Martha Jane is in at the very start of the film. A similar kind of uh, thing is happening with Oscar Michaud's cinema and this moment of the rape and how it is shown and what is left in the minds of the viewers. The use of cutting to or, or going to a, an intertidal car to suggest the passage of time and then everything becomes uh, still and quiet but we know that a torrent of violence and horror and tragedy has befallen. And so this is an, one of the, the, the most vivid and uh, ultimately so disturbing uses of the warping of time and space in the cinema of Oscar Michaud. And this is, again, another testament to the real power of uh, Oscar Michaud's cinema as it's being displayed here in this film. Uh, really, really powerful stuff. It's, inc it's an incredible moment. It's chilling, absolutely chilling, horrifying. Um, and uh, it's all done through the power of, of uh, Michaud's uh, uh, artistry as a cinematic artist. Uh, we also see, of course, the employing of, of flashback structures. Uh, we should note that the moment of true uh, psychological trauma that was experienced, uh, that was inflicted upon the character of, of Isabel, which is the, uh, the scene that I just described, you know, the, uh, the rape. Uh, this is a moment that is expressed in a flashback structure. And this also recalls, if you will, the revelations about Sylvia Landry's character in the film Within Our Gates and how that is revealed to us also in a similar type of flashback structure, as if almost to suggest that these moments of trauma, of psychological horror and trauma, are almost 
isolated uh, in time and space uh, in a way that is almost in, in cinematic terms suggestive of the nature of psychological trauma. And so I, I find this to be uh, an interesting way. I don't know if it was done on purpose, but uh, regardless of that, this is still yet another way that Oscar Michaud is using cinema uh, in a way to reflect, if you will, uh, the, uh, the, the, the psychological and uh, to, to show us uh, how trauma is portrayed, uh, again, through the use of time and space. But what is also going into, again, to borrow the phrase of Charles Musser, the radical formalism of Oscar Micheaux's cinema here is the dream sequence. This film is ultimately a one long dream sequence, and we see Martha Jane wake up from her reverie, from her nightmare, into the end of the film, which is the reality of the film that we end with, a happy ending. Sylvester is successful, Isabel is alive and happy, and thus Martha Jane is also happy as well. And the characters live, uh, at, at, we end the, the film with the characters happy, with the hopes that they will all live happily ever after. And uh, thus ends the film, at least the print that we have, the George Eastman House uh, print that we have. And so uh, this is, uh, th therefore, uh, to say that uh, Oscar Micheaux does employ these uh, very almost uh, out-of-nowhere tricks of cinematic storytelling uh, to uh, give us uh, stories that uh, remind us also that he is also trying to entertain Oscar Micheaux has always been described as being an entertainer as well as being a filmmaker who has a real uh, sense of a social conscience. And so uh, I see this as being his way of trying to entertain and trying to, in a way, for one brief moment anyway, uh, take us out of the horror of the nightmare. Uh, and uh, as the film ends, we are left with a, a, a real a happy ending. Uh, which we understand that uh, we want these characters to have. And so uh, I, I find this to be a, a yet a further example of how Oscar Micheaux is really trying to stretch and use cinema uh, in, in many ways at the same time, both in terms of, a, of a, uh, uh, his uh, social concerns and also his concerns with other art forms and the theater and also his solutions to problems and his critiques of church and religion, but also he wants to entertain. And uh, I, I see this as being a, a great example of that. Now, again, we have to go to the scholarship and uh, we have to understand according to the scholarship of, of, um, of uh, Thomas Cripps and Donald uh, Bogle and also Professor Musser and others, we understand that this film um, was subject to uh, uh, censorship by, uh, for example, the New York Board of Censors in 1925. And so we're not sure exactly uh, the, the version that we have for us now to watch, uh, how much it reflects of, of the director's cut of the film uh, that Oscar Micheaux made of Body and Soul. So the point here is that the film was subject to a certain aspects of censorship issues. Uh, and this combined with the print that we now have, where there seem to be some gaps in narrative, would suggest, of course, that we're not getting the entire full length film. And in fact, this is described as being, uh, according to Charles Musser, the George Eastman house print is uh, 7,700 feet. Uh, and the film, Body and Soul, was originally advertised as being nine reels. So that would suggest the absence of at least a thousand feet, uh, maybe a little bit more. And so uh, that would suggest that perhaps that we're not getting the absolute full version of the film. But as Charles Musser also suggests, we're getting, I think, a good substantial portion of it or almost all of it. So uh, uh, and so I, I, and we have to also remember that uh, uh, at the same time, uh, this is a film that uh, you know, wasn't seen. Uh, it wasn't seen for the longest time. And so uh, the fact that we are now able to see it now, together with some other films by Oscar Michaud, I think is a really great thing. And it's uh, just, uh, we should really value this. Uh, 
uh, especially considering the fact that many of uh, Oscar Micheaux's other silent films, as of now, have not been found, and they're considered lost films, which is a real shame, considering that Oscar Micheaux's career, uh, his silent film career, is just splendid by the very fact that he made these three films alone. He is a true artist. He is one of the great cinematic artists, and he really should be considered that way. Judging, as I say, from these three films, uh, he is working so hard, and he is working uh, on so many levels, and he is also trying to entertain, and he's also trying to send messages, and he's sometimes doing it uh, against uh, critical backlash. Uh, his films weren't always all, all the time praised. There were sometimes a lot of critics, uh, especially about this film, Body and Soul. Again, refer to Charles Musser's article, and he has a great breakdown as to some of the critical reaction. Some of it being from some of the African-American press at the time, uh, being critical of how Oscar Micheaux, for example, was depicting negative characters, uh, very evil characters who were African-American, the reverend, uh, and also attacking the church, or seemingly attacking the church in this film. And so these weren't necessarily uh, uh, positive uh, depictions of positive uh, 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 noble characters in the African American community, uh, and so uh, I think Charles Musser is is uh, suggesting quite rightly, I think, that uh, some of the criticism uh, probably stems from this these depictions. But Oscar Micheaux, again, at the same time, wasn't trying to depict all these positive images all the time in his films. He was trying to say something significant, say something that was relevant and pertinent to the times. And he would use uh, characters that were villainous. And he would also use characters that were righteous and noble. And he would use scenes of tragedy. And he would also use scenes of joy and triumph. But it would all be... Uh, for the sake of his cinema, that was always trying to say something, that was always trying to deal with the moment, and that was also trying to entertain and to try to tell a good story. Uh, and given uh, what he, uh, what the materials that he was working with, given the the times in which he was living in, and given all the challenges that he had was facing, he still came out with breathtaking works of cinema that. Uh, are, uh, as I say, operating on so many levels that make them all, including this film, Body and Soul, worth watching and re-watching and re-watching and re-watching again. They hold so many mysteries, they hold so many uh, moments to treasure and to ponder and to question and to wonder and to think and to, and to be challenged by and to be disturbed by and ultimately to walk away and to go away from those moments and to, 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 uh, to uh, experience those moments and, and, and come through at the end of the films, uh, perhaps thinking something different than what we were thinking at the very start of the film. And I think that's the ultimate point of uh, watching cinema is to express or to feel something that is being expressed on screen and to feel it really deep down affect you. Uh, and that is certainly the case with Oscar Michaud, but to, uh, uh, to add to that, not only is he doing that with the cinema, he's doing it in a way that is artistically brilliant, poetic, challenging, experimental. He's working uh, just with every part of the frame. Anything he can get his hands on, he's, he's doing, and he's trying his best and to, to, uh, to challenge himself and to really push himself to, uh, to create the great art that he ended up making. One of which, of course, being this film, Body and Soul. Okay, my friends, so that's it for now. And uh, thank you very much for uh, staying around. I really appreciate it. And so we will continue with our kind of conversations about these films in this great curated series, Pioneers of African American Cinema. I look forward to seeing you at the next video. But until then, my friends, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much again, my dear friends, for your time. And cheers.